I should be ready now, Josh. Hello and welcome to today's CapEx live event on the French election. My name is John Ashmore. I'm the editor of CapEx and I am delighted to welcome Gavin Mortimer, who is an author who lives in Paris and writes regularly about French politics and society for The Spectator, and Georgina Wright, who is an expert on European affairs at the Institut Montaigne. Guys, thank you very much for joining us. Um, there's plenty for us to get into. On the face of it, the 2022 election is very similar to the 2017 election. We have Emmanuel Macron and En Marche against Marine Le Pen's slightly rejigged titled uh, Rassemblement National, formerly the Front National, but she's gone through a big rebrand, and we'll get into that over the next uh, hour or so with you guys. Uh, just to our audience, if you do have any questions, please do put those in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put them in the chat, because that will just get very overcrowded and confusing. Uh, questions in the Q&A box. Uh, in terms of the format, the first 40 minutes or so, I will be having a discussion with Georgina and Gavin, and then we will devote the last 15 to 20 minutes to your questions. Try to keep them pithy and on topic, please. Um, and I will try and get through as many of them as possible. Uh, right, so first up, I mean, Georgina, as I said in the intro there, on the face of it, this is quite a similar election to last time. Uh, but, I mean, how similar is 2022 to, to 2017? And what do you think of the big changes there have been in, in the last five years in French politics? Um, so, yeah, I can see why people think um, that it is very similar, but actually it feels, and I'm sure Gavin will, will, will say this, it feels very different. Uh, for starters, there hadn't really been a, a presidential campaign. Um, sorry, my... Thank you. Um, there hadn't really been a presidential campaign, and that's partly explained because of the war in Ukraine, which is understandably like overshadowed much of the political debate, but also because uh, Emmanuel Macron, so the president, didn't really decide to run until very uh, until very last minute. And so we all knew he was going to run, but of course he hadn't actually declared that he was running. And when he did, um, he didn't really do that much campaigning. So in, this, in a sense, it does feel quite different. And if you look at what's happened in 2017, well, obviously you had, you know, in the final round, a new centrist uh, a leader, you know, candidate that was that was uh, heading a new um, party that had come out of a movement. Uh, there was no sort of centre left or centre right uh, in the party represented in the final round, and then of course uh, the far right. And there was the sense of, oh my goodness, is this is this the beginning of a new trend? Is this you know the beginning of the complete political fragmentation? of uh, the French political landscape, or is it just 2017? And actually what we see now is that really that was this, this it hit, the political fragmentation has continued. And you see uh, the centre, uh, that sort of the whole debate being really torn between the centre and two extremes. Um, and then very finally, I think you see obviously a rise in popularity for the far right, uh, but also huge support for the hard left, although that you know, if you actually look at the people who did vote for Mélenchon, who is the, 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 the hard left candidate, there are some people who, as we say in France, ont voté utile, which meant that they wanted to see a kind of left wing candidate in the second round. And they thought that their best bet was to back Mélenchon over perhaps Andelgo, who, who represented the Socialist Party. But I would say my big takeaways are clear political fragmentation and the fact complete absence really of, of political debate and presidential campaigning and of course this is why these sort of next couple of days are so crucial because it's all really happening now. Thanks very much so it's very very uh, comprehensive overview. I mean Gavin you're, you wrote a recent piece in The Spectator saying that uh, basically France is, is heading for a period of quite profound social unrest. And where is this coming from? We know about the Gilets Jaunes movement, concerns about the cost of living, which are affecting all sorts of Western countries. But what do you put this, the fragmentation that Georgina spoke about, what do you put that down to? Well, in, in one French word, uh, which is translates best as despair. There's just a, a, a feeling of despair, which obviously manifested itself four years ago in the Gilets Jaunes. That hasn't gone away. That was crushed in quite brutal fashion by the um, by the police. Interestingly, um, there's uh, one of the reasons why the 
the left are tempted to vote in for Le Pen. The latest statistics say that about a third will vote for Macron, or this is Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a third will vote for uh, Le Pen and the rest will uh, will go and do something else next Sunday. Is the um, the resentment still that burns of after the Gilets jaunes and the way that it was suppressed? I went to quite a few of those Gilets jaunes marches in Paris as an observer, and there was really no political, it was very diverse. Um, it tended to be what I would classify as blue collar workers, men, women, predominantly white, but it was quite uh, ethnically diverse. Um, and just people who had obviously, uh, if you remember, started because of the um, uh, a green fuel tax and, and the feeling that, that Paris just wasn't listening, that Paris was in its own little, we talk about the Westminster bubble, you've got the Paris bubble too. Um, so I think that there's a real despair and uh, as Georgina said, I think the big difference between now and 2017, 2017, Macron, Macron offered something new. There was hope. He was this man in his 30s with no real political baggage. He, he served for a short time in the Hollande socialist government. So there was a feeling that, oh, finally, perhaps we are going to see some change after Hollande, Sarkozy, Chirac, had all been much of a muchness. And that hasn't really come to pass. So that, I think, has exacerbated this despair that is felt uh, by the French. And the other thing, just picking up on what Georgina said, absolutely right about the political fragmentation, but also what's so interesting is the generational fragmentation. So if you look at how the, the generation voted, um, Mélenchon did best uh, between the, the 18 to 35 year old demographic, uh, Le Pen, 35 to 65 year old, and then 70s, it was overwhelmingly for Macron by a huge amount. So I think 41% voted for Macron in the next, I think it was about 25 voted for um, I think maybe in the Republican. But anyway, so that, that shows you that. I, mean, I, I think that's quite unhealthy that you have. Um, such a, a divide between Macron, the centre, whose voters are, uh, they tend to be quite affluent um, and, and retired. And, uh, and I think the, uh, that doesn't bode well um, for the future. And as I said, you alluded um, to the article I wrote for The Spectator about predicting uh, social unrest, that um, I do see that. I think in September, we're going to see there's a lot of disgruntled people out there. Um, particularly on the left, that they've got no representation. And uh, I think that anger will manifest itself on the street. And Georgina, one of the things that's been picked up less because the headlines have tended to be the sort of shock that Le Pen is, you know, with a serious chance of becoming president, is the, the collapse of the traditional left and right in France. I mean, we look back to 2012, the, I think it was the UMP and the Socialist Party got 57% of the vote. If you tally up the Republican Socialist vote this time, it's 7%. Is this just because Macron has come out and hoovered up their voters? I mean, are there structural problems with those parties? I and mean, what's going on here? Why have those parties done so badly? I mean, how, how long do we have, John? There are several reasons why why they're not doing as well. Um, and also, if you look at sort of centre left uh, parties in, in other countries, it can be it, 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 you, know, you sort of can draw the same uh, conclusions. And for some centre right parties as well. I mean, I think for starters, um, Les Républicains. A lot of people in France do identify to uh, Les Républicains, and a lot of people do identify to the Socialist Party. And you see it at the regional and local elections. Right, they, they're very strong. Those are the those are the two parties that tend to do uh, very very well and perform very well in, in local and regional elections. I think one of my main lessons is how personified the presidential election has become. It it seems to not really be about the party anymore. It seems to be about the candidate, uh, and that that poses all sorts of problems. A because the constitution. French constitution makes very clear that it's the prime minister and the government that sets policy. Uh, but actually, in practice, the president has huge amounts of power. And even more so um, if, you know, he or she manages to secure a parliamentary majority or a sort of 
a majority in Parliament that would support uh, his or her ambition. So in practice, the president has a lot of power, but the constitution does make clear it's the, it's the prime minister and, and the government. So how personified it's become means that there seems to sometimes be a disconnect slightly between the, you know, some voters actually aren't going casting about because they believe in the party or because they're a party member, but actually because they really quite like the candidate. And the third thing I'd say is there was a lot of vote utile. So um, people going in and actually reluctantly voting for someone. Uh, they they you know preferred another candidate, but they thought actually that would be a wasted vote. And so it would be far better for me to to kind of vote for for Macron. And, that, and you apparently I mean they're still drilling down to see you know, why and who voted for Macron, who voted for Mélenchon and all the rest of it. But but there seems to be a lot of um, centre-right voters who did end up voting for Macron in the first round because they thought that, uh, that you know, could you remember the first, like the last couple of days just before the first round, it was all about, oh my goodness, maybe there'll be Mélenchon and Le Pen, you know, far, <laughs> hard, you know, far right and then the hard left. And so a lot of, I think, uh, people sort of close to the centre on either side decided to, to, to vote for Macron. So I think um, let's not, you know, exaggerate the collapse of the mainstream political parties in the whole of the French political system, because they are very popular at the regional local level. But clearly, uh, the presidential race has become personified. And the third thing I'd say is, there were so many candidates, 12 candidates running. I mean, on the left, if you if you put the Green Party in there, they had six candidates. I mean, that's just huge. Um, and so it also split the vote. Um, and then on the right, you had two far right uh, candidates, and then you had Valérie Pécresse, who um, who many people think you know just didn't have a very good campaign, and that's also probably why people said, "Do you know what? I'll, I'll vote for Macron instead." But but they're still drilling, they're still looking into it, and there's a lot of analysis I think that's expected over the next couple of days. I, right. Well, I just, no, yeah, I just sorry, Gavin, call you. That, a couple of points that um, I think. We have to look too when you talk about the collapse of the centre right and centre left votes at the effect of the internet and social media. Because up until really 10, 15 years ago, elections you were covered in the uh, the, the main newspapers, whether it's the Figaro centre right, um, Le Mans centre left, and the the main television, um, the broadcasters, and they were again fairly centre left, centre right, and um and so people, particularly young people, weren't exposed to the ideas, more extreme ideas, whether they're to the left, to the right. Now, that since the, um, uh, the uh, internet and particularly social media and Mélenchon has been particularly, uh, ironically in a way, because he's the, uh, at 70, he was the, uh, the oldest candidate in the, uh, in the first round, yet he's the most canny at using social media and TikTok and Twitter, et cetera. Um, but I think it's just opened up to young people um, other avenue, the internet and social media, they, they get their um, information they, uh, from other sources now. So on YouTube, there are, are many clips that are, are, are up on um, the, the candidates, but on YouTube, on social media. So I think that's that's another uh, factor that has to be taken into account. And, and talking specifically about the Socialist Party, in uh, 2011, they... Um, uh, commissioned a, rep uh, a very comprehensive report by a think tank, Terra Nova, that predicted that the future was progressive and that really it was time to, to do away with the white working class and to move into this new, um, uh, wonderful, up, up, uh, uplifting era. Uh, and they took that advice. Now, obviously, they won the election the next year, 2012, but that was a vote really against Sarkozy. But they, they've gradually moved away from their base. And here you see parallels with the British Labour Party. Um, and yet at the same time, they, they reached out more to, to ethnic minorities. Um, but then, of course, they one of the first acts that they passed, um, the Hollande government, was a same-sex marriage bill. And that didn't please a great many of the uh, French Muslims who voted, I think, in the first round of the 2012 election. 87% of French Muslims voted for Hollande. Um, and they weren't very happy with the same-sex marriage bill. So they, they managed in the space of about 18 months to alienate the white working class and then their, their, um, their very large block of um, Muslim vote. And so they've, they've really, uh, from a strategically, strategic point of view, it's just been one disaster after another for the, uh, for the Socialist Party. 
Yeah, Nurka and Hidalgo is the mayor of Paris. I think only got two percent in the first round, which doesn't suggest she was the the greatest candidate they've ever fielded. Um, I just want to get on to the actual policy offer of the two main candidates and where they're deriving their support from. We've touched on it a bit. Gavin mentioned in his article there about how Macron commands a lot of support among older voters, for example. But we often talk about Le Pen as being far right. But, you know, I work for a centre-right think tank and I look at her policy offer and there's almost nothing that I would say I agree with, apart from wanting to expand nuclear energy. I mean, it's, it strikes me that she is more of a kind of protectionist, nationalist uh, um, sort of a politician than, than a right wing one in, in the British sense of the word. I mean, um, Gavin, what's your take on, on Le Pen's brand and the kinds of policies um, that what, what are the kind of what's the core policy offer for, from her to French voters? Firstly, I don't use the term far right, extreme right when talking about Marine Le Pen. Her father, yes, but uh, I don't think she is. Um, no doubt there are people within her party, her supporters who are extreme right, but she's not. Economically, um, she's she's left wing. 60, uh, there was an interesting article I read recently from a statistical analysis of her economic manifesto, 66% was left wing. Um, and it's much more, as you said, protectionist, a lot of um, it's quite statist, and uh, and this is why she's appealing to the young people. So, for example, it's, it's lower VAT, higher wages, tax exemptions, free transport for younger workers, um, and it's um, of, and of course this is why I mean it's, it's interesting that the Republican voters are far more likely to vote for um, Macron than they are Le Pen, and I think twenty five percent of Zimmer. Um, supporters who voted for Zimmer in the first round will vote for uh, Macron. And that's because economically, you know, they don't want some, um, uh, 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 Zimmer was, it's, it's much more traditionally right wing economically work in everything. Really. And um, so, um, and, and that's what, I think that explains the um, appeal of Marine Le Pen, because we, might, we mustn't forget that it's been in, in many ways a disaster, but, but Six months leading up to the election, we had the rise of Eric Zimmer, who, who really, uh, for, for the first couple of months when he uh, put forward his nomination uh, uh, at the end of last year, he, he rose in the, the polls and then he got about four or five important defections from Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party to his own. And one thought at the beginning of the year, this is the end for Le Pen, but um, she's nothing if not tenacious. Uh, but also she was very canny because she's, She's, she's let um, Zimor recenter her. So it's Zimor who's been talking, you know, at times quite unpleasantly about immigration and, uh, and, and Islam's place in France. And she's just focused on the cost of living crisis, which is the major preoccupation for the, uh, for the French by some considerable way. I think it's, it's about 60% for cost of living and then immigration is next and about half of that. Um, so she's, she's talked obviously about immigration, um, but it's, it's, it's the cost of living, the cost of living. Macron's great mistake, as we alluded to earlier, was to think that just portraying himself as the war leader was enough. And of course, he had the shuttle diplomacy with, with Putin, which ended in failure. Um, and it was only at the beginning of March that he began to realize, hold on, I think I've, I've blundered here. And, um, uh, and in the meantime, Le Pen was doing what Macron did five years ago, crisscrossing France, going into the deprived areas, saying, I understand your pain, I'm here to help. And it's been working. Yeah, just picking up on something Gavin said there, um, Georgina, to what extent do you think Le Pen has authentically changed her positions on things versus tailoring her message to make herself more electable? The most obvious uh, example of which was changing the name of the party. But also, I believe they expelled Jean-Marie Le Pen from the national rally, which I felt like felt like a pretty sort of symbolic moment to say, we're not that old version of this party. We're something new, uh, a sort of patriotic right wing I wouldn't say Gaullist, but, you know, much, much more in keeping with French political traditions. 
Yes, that's a really good question and actually sort of builds quite nicely on what Gavin was saying, because of course, you know, you can take Marine Le Pen and look at what she's done, but it, the context matters as well. And the fact that the Eric Zemmour was running to meant that in many, you know, in the minds of many French voters, they're like, oh, well, she's much more of a moderate and a centrist than, than, than people say. And look, look, just compare her to Eric Zemmour. Whereas Gavin's right, when you actually look at what they're proposing, um, there are some things that are similar, some things that are very different, but it's not, it's not sort of clear cut between far right and not so much, but it's it, in, in the sort of image and, 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 and in the minds of many French voters, she's definitely more of a centrist. And so people um, think that she's softened her views on a lot of things, um, but, it, the, but the question is, has she softened her views or has she just improved her messaging? Because the two things that, that, kind of you know with there are lots of criticisms leveled at Marine Le Pen but the two main ones from last year is oh she's simply not presidential uh you know she she doesn't she doesn't um speak in the name of what well, that's certainly not true now she you know she really is trying to contrast her image with Macron and saying Macron's a president for the rich but I'm a president for all and as Gavin said traveling all across France to rural areas to smaller cities outside of France because it's called not just in front, metropolitan France but you know further out she's really traveled to try and, and build that and show that she is a presidential has uh, you know nuanced views even on foreign policy because a lot of her voters for example don't really care that much about uh, foreign policy and so she but she knows that to attract outside of her sort of traditional motivation needs to talk about other things so yes she is presidential and the second thing is yes she is you know a, a president for all um but that being said you know um i think macron was slow to, to, to campaign but he is campaigning now and uh macron is a formidable uh speaker and when he starts speaking he that you know that the people kind of when I talk even to, to, to people in Paris, so this isn't you know, based on, on polls or on surveys or anything, people say, well, what is it that he's suggesting for the next five years? Because in 2017, he was promising hope. Now he has a record. So what is it that he's going to do next? What does he want to carry on doing? What does he want to change? What, does, what are the mistakes he made? And can he admit to those? And then what is he promising? But his a real kind of asset is, is his ability to speak. Um, and it will be interesting because, of course, there, there is a, a debate scheduled on, on the 20th of April, which I'm sure Gavin will be watching as well. And just to see how, how different, because last year, uh, so not last year, last presidential uh, debate between them, and it was it went very badly for her because she wasn't able to respond and she was, and he just carried that much more. But now she's had five years to prepare. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how that works yeah just picking up on that um gavin what with macro is is he is there much difference in his platform this time round? is he essentially offering more of the same you know i'm a safe pair of pants i'm i've got a good economic record is that essentially his pitch or is it just an anti-le pen pitch a, a kind of combination of those the combination, I think. I mean, he has done, he has done well. Unemployment at a, a ten-year low. Uh, there's been 25 unicorns. Um, startups France have, have has uh, notched its 25th unicorn at the beginning of the year. He had a little startups. ceremony, I think, for that. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We well, see this is, and that goes to the heart of it because that is very much Macron's France. You know, let's think back five years. It was a startup nation. And in that sense, France has gone quite well. So there's been um, a record uh, in tech funds raised by tech companies. Um, and uh, and when you look, Georgine is right. He, he's got this. He's a great speaker. He did this rally 10 days ago at a rugby stadium just west of Paris. Um, and it was uh, full of 30,000 capacity. Um, and I watched it on, on TV and it was fascinating because he spoke for two hours without moats or on a stage. And uh, he is, he's a, he's a captivating um, speaker. But then you look at his audience and they are the startup nation. And what's been interesting this week is he's been out and about campaigning on the ground uh, on Monday in the north of um, France, Le Pen territory. Tuesday, it was in the east of France. And both times he had quite um, uh, feisty confrontations with yeah. disgruntled Frenchmen. And this is when he doesn't come across well, because Macron he doesn't so much talk with you, discuss with you. He talks at you. He talks down to you. And, and this is one of the reasons why in the European context, I cannot remember 
a politician as divisive um, as Macron is since Margaret Thatcher. You either think they are great or you just shake with rage at the sight of them. And that's very much Macron. And this is what's going to be the fascinating aspect between in the next 10 days. Um, I mean, it's, it's what's so depressing is it's such a negative campaign. It's really, OK, yeah, at least I'm not Le Pen. At least I'm not Macron. And as the expression goes, soft sort of Macron. So that's Le Pen slogan, really. Anyone but Macron. So, OK, you, you might not like me or some of my policies, but at least my name's not Emmanuel Macron. Right. And, um, and this is going to be, uh, and, and she's directing that at the uh, 7 million people who voted for Mélenchon. And um, many of whom, as we said earlier, loathe Macron. But do they loathe him enough to vote for Le Pen? That's going to be the key. Yeah, I remember I saw a poster and it's sort of Macron's black and white and it says, sans lui avec Marine. And she's all in colour, looking kind of beaming and, and so on. It was very striking. Well, just, um, to, I mean, that's, just to, a, a little anecdote that sort of illustrates this. Um, around this election time in France, you have the boards go up on the streets with the posters of a 12, of a how many candidates, 12 candidates in this case. And um, it's interesting because in a couple near me, you in the past, uh, within about a day of them going up, someone drew the face off Le Pen. This time, Le Pen and Zimmer were intact and someone had ripped the face of Macron. And and I thought that's interesting because I'm I'm in an area that you know mm -hmm. Paris voted for Macron. So I thought that was very interesting. And you know, it's young people doing this, I imagine, but it just shows you how how much he's he's loathed, even more than Le Pen and Zimmer in some cases. Yeah, Georgina, what is the source of that loathing that Gavin describes? We often see Macron described as the président des riches or a president of the elite. He is a creature of the so-called énarchie, you know, a graduate of the um, ENA, which is sort of like Oxbridge on steroids. I think there's only 80 candidates and he came fifth. You know, um, is it a combination of that kind of auteur that he seems to have? He seems to talk down to people a lot and his actual policies. I mean, what, what's driving this this very strong feeling towards him? Yeah, I mean, some voters have. So. <laughs> exactly. It kind of depends who, who you ask. Um, if you think back to 2017, a number of uh, left wing voters voted for Macron because he said, I'm not right wing. I'm not left wing. I'm at the centre. Um, and he really was the candidate for hope. And I think a lot of uh, centre-left left wing voters have felt extremely disappointed in his mandate because, as, as Gavin said, you know, it, it has been very much about innovation. I mean, he's brought unemployment right down. Um, he's, he's done a number of things that have really kind of boosted the economy, but that have been overwhelmingly seen to have benefited a few rather than everyone else. And I think a lot of his, a lot of people who voted without, you know, there, there was no question they knew they were gonna vote for him in 2017, now say that they're not going to vote at all in the second round. Uh, and this is, you know, less two evils and I'd rather not take part in it. So I think there are those ones who have been disappointed in his economic policy predominantly. Uh, then you've got those who, who you know, like the Gilets Jaunes, who, who felt, uh, again, that some of the decisions that were made were going to adversely impact them more than anyone else, and felt that when, uh, you know, when he tried to respond to that, he sort of tried to use uh, just to an argument and was lacking empathy there. And, and that's one of the reasons why some people also say he's, you know, he's so, he, he thinks he's above, but there are lots of people who do actually like him too and I think that that's it's it's, it's as Gavin says he really is he divides frankly you either like him or you don't but there are lots of people who do uh, like him and I think there will still be a number of people who who will turn out to vote on the 24th not loving him and uh, not being sort of overjoyed about the prospect of another five years with Emmanuel Macron but who realize that actually that's probably the better outcome out of the two so um, but it's it's difficult to pinpoint exactly. But certainly there is, if you read newspapers, and there's a sense that he has his policies have overwhelmingly benefited a few, uh, and that actually he tends to talk down on people and, and, and is arrogant and it's not. But again, it's not it's not sort of black or white really. Well, it is a bit if you talk to people, but actually when you look at what they're saying, it's not. There is more nuance to it. Sure. Um, and Gavin, what are the 
core issues in in this election? And, and more broadly, what do you think are the the cause of structural economic problems facing France and particularly facing younger voters? Because as you both noted, they tended to go for the more extreme candidates, which suggests a kind of deep seated dissatisfaction mm. among yeah. a certain demographic. Yeah, it's it's um, it's your anywheres against your somewheres. It's your haves, your have nots, the winners and losers of globalization. Uh, Macron is obviously a Europhile. He's a globalist. Uh, Le Pen is not, and she is. She she realised that Frexit is a turnoff, so she's she's diluted her language on Europe, but she's a Eurosceptic. Um, and she's, so she's appealing to those people who feel left behind by um, globalization. And it's, and there are a lot of them. And, and this, is the, this is the problem. And of course, as we just talked about, Macron has, has, has millions of, of supporters. Yeah, we, we mentioned at the beginning that uh, the, the over 70s voted for him, but we mustn't forget that he, he also does very well uh, among uh, particularly metropolitan middle-class young people. Um, the sort of the, the startup um, uh, nation, and so I think it's it's really it, to, to put it crudely, it is it is that it's what is your vision for the future? Are you uh, someone who sees very much like Macron uh, greater integration um, with Europe, uh, or are you as Le Pen has been pushing France first? Um, and, and you know we see sh- shades, I suppose of of Donald Trump. She famously, in uh, I think in six years ago, went to New York to try and meet Donald Trump, but, but failed. But um, I think she is, she, she's, she's learned from that. And, and Georgina said um, a few minutes ago that uh, about that disastrous debate in 2017, uh, and it was a disastrous debate. And that's going to be fascinating. Um, I think it's on next Wednesday in six mm-hmm. days um, to see, uh, because Macron's going to go for her. That's, that's, is he, he yeah. doesn't think she's changed that much and has she changed and will she wilt under the pressure because as we've again just mentioned Macron is a great speaker he's got a head full of stats it's like a it's a computer and he'll just pull out these economic stats but of course she'll look to go back at him about the yellow vests about the um the social brutality as she described it and um and the and yeah, what it boils down to uh, the haves and the have-nots, and uh, and what will Macron's response be? So it's it's and and that I think is why it's it's such a an uh, an emotional campaign, if you like, among voters that they feel there is so much at stake here. Yeah, let's talk about that debate a bit. I mean, what do you think, Georgina? Macron's lines of attack will be, and one one thing just. On, on that is, I've, having looked at some of Marine Le Pen's policies, I mean, they really are strikingly illiberal in some areas, and they really do seem to sort of cut at the very fabric of the French Republic. I mean, she's talking about stripping people of their citizenship if they express Islamist ideology, for example. I mean, which, which sort of, where do you think her weak spots are and how will he try to expose them? Um... <laughs> I mean, I think Gavin's right. Um, Macron's going to go for, for what she's proposing because um, actually, if you look at, and, and, and that kind of goes back to John, your question you said earlier about her messaging, you know, have her, have her proposals changed or has her messages her messaging changed and actually on a lot of things it's simply the messaging she just says it slightly differently um, and so it sounds better if you're you know if you if you're someone who doesn't feel quite comfortable with what she's suggesting then it sounds better it sounds kind of more centrist and moderate but then actually in practice um, it's it's very much what she was saying uh, five years ago or, or even ten years ago, um, and there are some really in, is striking things in there. Is you know her answers to um, tackling cost rising cost of living or rising energy prices is simply, for example, to take France out of the EU's electricity market. Uh, she says, you know, I'm going to take down any sort of uh, wind wind farms. I don't like those because the, the the and so I'm going to decarbonize and invest in other areas. And she's talking about you know, possible, she doesn't say those words, but if you look in practice, it's breaking EU state aid rules to be able to decide to do all sorts of things. So the way, you know, it's, it's, 
it's well and good saying that, but actually how it, in practice it will be a lot harder. And also it's not clear that the way that she's suggested doing that will actually give her the solution she's looking for. Um, and I think that's probably where, where he, will, he, he will attack her on that basis on the sort of practicality, the implementation side of what she's suggesting. Um, and also I think head on on, on some of her uh, positions on climate um, change, for example, because if you look at the first round, I mean, it's quite striking how uh, the climate agenda simply was apparently not a focus of, 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 of voters in the first round. I mean, the you know, Jadul, who was the Green candidate, didn't even make the 5%, so he won't be reimbursed on his uh, campaign costs and, and all the rest of it. And then if you look at the different, Marine Le Pen and Macron, neither of them have really made climate a central pillar of, of, their, of, their, of their campaign. But of course, Macron can say, well, I did the Paris Agreement and I'm this and I'm that and look at me and, and, and I'm all, all my records. So Again, I think he can challenge her on that. And then he can obviously challenge her on some of her, her, her views of stripping people of citizenship um, and also on, on immigration because she has very uh, stark proposals on, on that as well. Can I, yeah. can I just add something here? Sure. Um, I think it, it's going to be quite difficult for Macron to go for Le Pen when it comes to uh, painting her as an extremist. Because, of course, um, last year, his interior minister, Gerard Damana, uh, mocked Le Pen for being too soft, quotes, on Islam. Um, but more personally, uh, this is, he's nicknamed among some on the left, Macron, as a Bionia, a blinder, because of the number of yellow vest demonstrators who, had, who were blinded by these, um, these flashball weapons during the yellow vest um, protests. And, uh, and these were weapons that were condemned by um, the United Nations, various human rights uh, organizations. And of course, it was um, the, the COVID passport and his now infamous quote in January, I want to emerge, um, I don't know what I can say here on, on uh, CapEx, but oh, no, it's fine. pee off the French, but pee off those people either unvaccinated or who haven't had a third um, jab. And that went down really, really badly. But it also just ties in to um, his, his rather dis well, yeah, dismissive language um, about people. He's called them in the past slackers, um, resistant ghouls, and um, people who were nothing was another line of his in 2017, talking about when he was opening up, opening up a, tar uh, it was a, um, a startup centre and it used to be a railway station. And he said, I want you to admit cross paths with people who were nothing. I mean, an extraordinary comment to make. But that, I'm afraid, again, it, it explains why he's just detested by so many people. So I think that with what's gone on in the last, in his presidency, and his rather authoritarian um, reaction to, um, to various crises, makes it harder for him to, to go for Le Pen in that respect. And she can, and, and she's been, I mean, she, she was very slow. She only dumped on to the, the anti-COVID passports um, um, bandwagon uh, quite late on when she realised there were votes to be had in it. And, and again, I, I went on a couple of these marches last summer in Paris when there were well, 30,000, 40,000 people. And that was fascinating just to observe because, again, it was, it was a real cross-section of society um, and just people who were opposed um, to Macron. There's lots of Macron dimission, Macron resign as they, as they um, uh, went through the streets. And no, no other political chanting. So, so I think that that gives um, Le Pen so not so much a line of attack, but a, a means of defending herself when, when he attacked her and some of her more liberal policies. Can I, sorry, John, because that made me, Devin, made me think that obviously another big weak spot of hers is, is Russia. Uh, you know, and that was going to be my next question, actually. Yeah, so. it, it was how does Russia play? How, how she's obviously, you know, um, uh, flaunted in the past her proximity to, to Vladimir Putin. I mean, there was this 
rumor that she'd um you know printed i don't know how many hundreds of thousands of leaflets of her shaking vladimir putin's hand and then he invaded uh, uh well russia invaded ukraine and so and so she was like oh well we can't use those anymore and she's kind of dodged that by saying of course i'm pro sovereignty so i support ukrainian sovereignty oh but i you know don't think we should be exporting any more arms uh, to ukraine or, or or doing any political support and and she has already in her press conference yesterday uh, she was quizzed about NATO and all sorts of things, and she's clearly very anti, uh, uh, well, not anti-American, but on, she wants a far uh, looser uh, partnership with the United States. Um, and I think that's also going to be one of her, her weak spots, because, as I said, foreign policy isn't really something her voters tend to care about all that much. Um, she has got better about talking about foreign policy because she realized she needed to. Um, but her positions will obviously be 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 attacked, for lack of a better word, in, in the next couple of days. Hmm. OK, well, we're going to move on to some questions from our audience now. And I have one from one of my colleagues, in fact, from uh, Carl, it, it, which I quite like. It, it, it actually follows on quite neatly from what you were saying there about foreign policy, but it's about the UK. Um, the period since 1945 was recently described by one French diplomat as the third hundred years war. Uh, so after 1337 and 1689 um, for history buffs. Uh, so we've got 30 years still left to run on that. Um, from that perspective, who should the UK want to become president? Macron or Le Pen? Who's more anti-British? And Macron said some quite harsh things about it. He seems to really hate Boris Johnson, particularly. Um, what, what's their, what's the, the Le Pen take on, on Britain? Uh, Gavin, what do you think? Oh, she's... Um, yeah, first, you have to remember that while we Brits tend to have... We, we have a strange <laughs> obsession with, with, with France and, uh, and uh, <laughs> they, they, okay. they find us rather eccentric uh, and endearingly so, but they're, they're not at all obsessed. But you don't get lots of books written by French people about, you know, these... <laughs> bizarre culture over the water so um and Le Pen is very much um uh, embodies that rather indifference I suppose she's she's spoken of uh, uh approval of of Brexit so in that in that respect yeah as you said uh, Macron has been among EU leaders the most ferocious opponents and of, of Brexit and um um but I don't think uh, and and we look at the EU army for example and, and, and Macron, Macron wants far closer integration there. Um, Le Pen doesn't, but she doesn't, she, she's very much just focused on France. So I don't think she would be rushing over the channel to uh, to embrace another blonde-haired um, leader. I think that um, uh, she she doesn't really think, well, I'd say think much about Britain, not in a, in a sort of a derogatory sense, but just it's not, it's not high up on a list of, uh, yeah. of um, campaign uh, manifestos. But Georgina, when, when you hear Macron say these things about the UK, and particularly about Brexit and Boris, I mean, is he doing that for domestic consumption or do you think that's sort of genuine frustration, off the cuff sort of stuff? No, I, I think he's, and Gavin's absolutely right, it's really important to remind people that just in France, the UK really isn't really a topic of conversation. And, you know, oftentimes I, I have friends in, in London who think, well, you know, how? We're like, you know, allies and everything else. And I think, well, partly because once the UK does start to do things differently, then maybe people will, you know, live over the pond and take more of an interest. But at the moment, it's just like, oh, well, you know. So it was like, and, and most of their, you know, for Macron, it's obvious that he's going to be looking much more at what Germany and what the e what's happening in the EU, because the EU is such a central pillar of his his domestic and foreign policy. And I think when he uses, uh, you know, harsh words about the UK, it's a uh, it's a because he you know personally is is a bit annoyed at some of the things that come out of London, but also I think he's possibly reflecting a lot of what French people uh, think uh, as well, and that actually. Uh, you know, um, I think for particularly a lot of Macron supporters who are, you know, tend to be pro EU, um, any sort of language that comes out of London that's a bit confrontational, combative towards the EU is, is counterproductive. But the French have said things that, you know, that, that, that London has been angry about. And, you know, they, I think there are faults on both sides. And, and But as long as Brexit, you know, I, I always felt that there had to be a mourning 
uh, you know, a, a time of mourning after Brexit before you could really Five stages of grief. <laughs> and then, but then you had that, and then you had a number of kind of disagreements over, you know, the um, Calais and, and, and migrant crossings, and AUKUS as well was was quite a big blow. And so it just seemed that there was a a little bit of, of a culmination of things that have meant that um, that discussions <laughs> at the highest political level have been very tense, but. You know, the war in Ukraine has changed that and they are talking uh, much more, at least at official levels, than they did. So they, they, it's not like they don't talk to each other. It's just that it's it's not as perhaps as uh, strong as it used to be. But on Le Pen, because she has said some interesting things about the UK. Yesterday in her press conference, you know, she commended the UK for Global Brighton, uh, as she, Global Brighton, uh, which I, I assume meant Global Britain, but she didn't really. Ah, uh, okay, Global Brighton meant. would be quite different. <laughs> exactly, Global Brighton. Yeah. Um, but it was quite interesting. And her, and her programme talks about, uh, you know, considers um, the UK a key ally. Uh, but actually, if you look at some of the things she said in interviews, and if you look further in, it, it, it makes clear that the partnership has to uh, serve French interests. So, you know, it would be good if, if British, the Brits did more of buying French, i.e. buy French armament. And she's also in, an, in, in a recent interview said that uh, she'd be keen to renegotiate those fishing license, which I'm like, no, we've just had an agreement now. Let's say. But she said she would reopen that and uh, and possibly make um you know uh, any sort of energy imports and exports conditional on, on on that so she she wouldn't be an easier partner uh, i think than macron has been um but who knows all right so a, a fairly um an interesting one for our but we are a center-right uh, think tank as i said before um jerome chalamel asks do you think that french true conservatives can vote for macron and by extension, I think, should they vote for Le Pen? I mean, where, where does a, a traditional conservative go in this election? Gavin, what do you think? And where will they go, more to the point? Um, it's an interesting, very interesting question. And um, as is Macron. Macron, I think, there is a, uh, a, a well-known commentator. He's, he's a business tycoon, used to be a, a former politician, Philippe de Villiers. Um, whose brother was the um, chief of staff who was sacked by Macron very early on in his presidency in the summer of 2017. And he's written several books. And uh, he, I should say, is, um, was a supporter of Zimmer. But um, his most recent book, which was published last year, was uh, he, he um, was, a, I suppose, a, a confidant of Macron in 2016, 2017. He was one of those who believed that Macron was very much the, the, the change, the new face that France needed. Um, and he has real, he's got the, the bitterness of a, of a betrayed lover, if you like. And uh, he's, in this book last year, he said that Macron is, is not, he's a left winger, he's a progressive. Uh, it's his wife, Bridget, who incidentally has been mysteriously absent from this whole campaign, which I find strange because I think she, she's a good asset. And, uh, um, uh, but she's been far less uh, prominent this time than she was five, six years ago. But anyway, uh, de Villiers said that yeah, Macron is a progressive and um, all this moving, he's just moved to the centre-right um, for expediency's sake. And, and it's going to be, there, there are sort of clues there that he is not really a conservative and he is a, uh, a progressive and dare I say it, a woke. And he, he's famously said uh, that there is no such thing as French culture. This was in 2017. And uh, some of the, um, his, his other pronouncements have, have been, um, every now and again, he just gives little clues. And um, it's, it's going to be, uh, so in answer to the question, uh, no, I don't think um, a true French Conservative uh, could vote for Macron. And Georgina, what do you think? I mean, how do you see, say, the sort of centre right. I mean, a lot of them already are. A lot of them already voting for Macron anyway. Um. Um, I mean, again, I can't really say because they has they haven't really. They're sort of doing the analysis now to see, yeah. you know, how these people did they vote Macron first time in two thousand seventeen? What did they vote beforehand? But if you look at a lot of his economic policy, it clearly is centre right, or as the French call it, liberal, which is. Right. Anglo-Saxon, maybe. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, and it's very, you know, obviously very um, uh, all to do about um, kind of innovation. Uh, the, you know, lots of reforms to um, like industries to make it easier for 
for small and medium uh, enterprises to to recruit, but also to possibly fire, like all of it. So they were making a lot of a, a lot of shit. that big one he wasn't able to pass was pensions reform, uh, but he has said that that's something that he would do. And then if you look at a lot of his ministers, quite a few of them are from uh, anciennement from les républicains. Uh, and so that includes his, uh, you know, uh, chancellor equivalent, so the finance uh, minister, Bruno Le Maire, Gérard Darmanin, the interior minister. So he has quite a lot of you know, generals who are all from the, from the centre-right. Mm. Um, it's more, I think there are quite a few centre-right voters who are socially conservative who feel that they could, they probably are closer to Le Pen on some of her positions. But on economic policy, um, I could see quite a few voting for Macron. Yeah, so okay. I, just, actually, I just want to clarify that I was talking more about social conservatism and um, um, okay. so what Georgina was saying, I, uh, economically, absolutely. Um, it was noticeable that when he gave this rally, uh, when he was at this rally uh, 10 days ago, one of the biggest cheers was when he said that um, he'll be pushing through PMA. Now, PMA is um, assisted uh, medical assisted birth, so allowing... Um, uh, lesbian couples, for example, to have to have children, and that got a that. This has been a, a very contentious issue in France for a long time because they are much more socially conservative than we are. But it's got a hu huge cheer in the uh, in the stadium, and of course, it enrages the likes of Marion Marichal, who we haven't talked about, and, uh, uh, the niece. Oh yeah, her niece. Yeah. And though I think we may well be seeing in the future because. Of course, something that we haven't really had time to talk about uh, much today is what happens in June in the parliamentary elections. That was going to be my next question. Actually. We'll come okay, on. I'll, so, I'll, I'll no, no, it's all right. You guys keep pre preempting me. It's obviously a, a logical train we're on. Um, so, yeah, what, let's say Le Pen gets elected then. How, how would that interact with the parliamentary elections? Let's say she wins the presidential and then doesn't do so well in the parliamentary elections, uh, would she actually be able to implement the bulk of her programme? Are there things that the president can do by fiat, the way that an American president signs executive orders? Can I answer this one? Yes, by all means. <laughs> the only reason being that there's a very interesting article in one of the French papers yesterday, um, and it was, it was interviewing, canvassing opinion among some of Mélenchon supporters, what, how they're going to vote in the second round. And some of them are thinking, oh, we, there's a chance here for a cunning plan. And their cunning plan is to get rid of, to vote Le Pen, get her president. That will destroy Macron and his whole party because it's a, it's a one it's a one man show. And once Ma if Macron's not president, on Marsh is finished. And so you've got Macron out of the way. And then in the, in the parliamentary elections, the left will be so determined to absolutely stymie Le Pen, that they will mobilise en masse um, behind Mélenchon. And interestingly today, Fabien Roussel, the communist candidate, who um, didn't, you know, for a communist, didn't do too badly, he got about two and a, two and a half percent of the vote, has, um, but he got a lot of flack um, by, uh, afterwards because if he hadn't stood and if those votes had gone to Mélenchon, he may have, may have been enough to get him into second place. But he... He wants uh, um, uh, to to alliance to ally with uh, Mélenchon in, this, in, the, uh, in the parliamentary election. So, so let's say then that uh, uh, that that means that um, the, the left would have control of the 577 seat National Assembly, rendering Le Pen a lame duck because Macron supporters would not vote for Le Pen. They're far more likely to vote for the left um, than Le Pen. And uh, whereas, of course, if if Macron is elected um, uh, for a second term, then his party he'll he'll probably do well. He will do what he did last time around: look to draw to lure some of the names from the centre-left socialists and the Republicans into his party. There's, there's talk today of Christine Lagarde being um, perhaps being offered the job of prime minister, and and so that would really. Uh, once again, lead to a big majority in the assembly. The left would be shut out. I think Mélenchon, his party has got 17 seats at the moment. Uh, the socialists, 45, I think. Um, and so once again, they would be shut out of power. So their way of thinking is, let's get Le Pen as president and then just make a, a lame buck because we'll uh, 
uh, she won't be able to push anything through because we'll have control of the uh, of the National Assembly. It's far-fetched, perhaps. Let's see what happens on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, Georgina, just picking up on that, how much latitude does a president have in the same way as in the States if the Congress is held, if Congress is held by the other party? How much could a Le Pen president do if, if the National Assembly uh, is full of people who will not vote with her or go along with her agenda? And do, can you end up, could you end up with this sort of cohabitation sort of thing where you have a totally different prime minister? Or, yeah, so, so this is where the in theory versus in practice is really important. So in theory, in, according to the French constitution, the Fifth Republic, it's the prime minister and the government that sets policy and decides on policy. Um, in practice, it's very much the president, um, but it's even more so the president when he basically has a majority in parliament he can rely on. Um, if the only time we've seen a cohabitation was before France introduced its reform. Uh, so before the, the presidential term was seven years uh, and then they reformed it to five years and then they introduced another reform after saying we'll have the presidential election and then about a couple of weeks later we'll have the legislative election. So the parliament and the presidential term kind of calendar coincides. And since that reform was in place, you haven't had a cohabitation because what you've seen is a president being elected, there's this whole euphoria, and then he basically is able to have the majority. And that's why in 2017, you saw Macron being elected on a passionately pro-European centrist platform and, and a party that had not existed until that point win a massive majority in the Assemblée Nationale because that election took place just after. The question is, A, if he is re-elected, will he manage to secure a majority? And if Le Pen elect is elected, would she be able to secure a majority? And if they don't, then technically they're supposed to appoint a prime minister from that majority. And that's why it's also difficult to pass stuff because you have a prime minister who has a different viewpoint who can say well the government doesn't agree but she's already said that um if she doesn't get the elected the parliamentary majority she likes she'll just simply uh dissolve, so, um you know basically uh, ask for another election parliament dissolve the parliament yeah, basically thank you. dissolve gosh I, I hate that when people are like oh i can't find the word but yeah <laughs> but she'd dissolve she'd dissolve the parliament to be able to run another election so um it, it would be tricky but she has ways of, of kind of asserting herself if she wants to um, we are coming. We've got about five more minutes. I'll try and get in a few more questions from our audience. This one I absolutely love, um, just for a sheer simplicity. Very quickly, it's, is Macron a megalomaniac? Um, just from uh, Gavin, any thoughts on that? Just quickly, we're going to have to sort yes. of rattle through these ones. Yes. <laughs> he does seem so, uh, quite fond of his own ability, but then, as you said, he does seem to have quite a sort of special intellect and... Speaking ability. Um, Georgina, what do you think? I think anyone who runs for the presidency of their country has got to have a bit of egocentricity about them. I think they have to have the confidence that they can lead, you know, uh, France. But but I think we, we've we looked at a lot of the things that he's not done so well. But again, I think it's important to remember there are lots of things that he that many people think he has done very, very well. Um, and again, his strong point is to be, it's just he hasn't really campaigned over the past couple of weeks. We haven't really talked about what he's achieved and what he hasn't achieved. Uh, and I think the more he campaigns, the more we'll see of him and the more perhaps he can he can come up. But, you know, they obviously need a lot of confidence to be able to run for president. Just quickly, what do you put that down to that he hasn't campaigned? Do you think just focused on foreign affairs, keeping his powder dry. I mean, because he was not that far ahead in the first round. I mean, so we, we all knew that he would, he was going to delay announcing that he was running. And that's because as soon as you announce, then you get the same airtime as everyone else. Whereas if you're president, you can get airtime whenever you like, right? This is what people, people think. And also he pretty early on said that he wouldn't be uh, take part in any uh, debates with every other candidate and, and all the rest of it. So there's part of, part of it is strategy, uh, to be honest. And the other reason is because of the war as well, which, um, which you know, some people say, well, that's not a good enough excuse, but actually there is a war happening in Europe and, and that's obviously taken up a lot of his time. Right. Okay. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned the war there, Georgina. Um, Question from Karen Wharton, which is, what would France's position be vis-a-vis -vis Russia if Le Pen were elected? How would it change things? We have touched on this a bit, but Gavin, what do you think? Do you think it would dramatically sort of change the balance in those terms? I mean, does France have a particularly 
prominent role in this anyway? Uh, no, I don't think it would change it much. Uh, it's another short answer, but uh, I don't uh, I don't think uh, Le Pen is going to drastically uh, change. I don't think it's she, she's uh, she has the means to to drastically change what's going on. Okay, Georgina, I, do you... I slightly disagree with. with okay, the finally <laughs> disagree. <laughs> Once she has said that she'd pull France out of NATO's military command structure. Now she might not do that, but she'll become much more difficult. France would become a more difficult ally within NATO. And I think that matters, especially at a time when there's, you know, transit that and sort of an emphasis on transatlantic unity vis-a-vis vis-a-vis Russia. And the other bit where she can be particularly tricky is on sanctions, uh, mm. where where the, you know every member state has a has a veto. Uh, and uh, she might be uh, more, especially especially if she thinks that the sanctions regime is going to have a disproportionate impact on, you know, sort of French, uh, more more of an impact on French citizens than than the sanctions have so far. So she, I think she can be, she she can change France's policy towards Russia. It was, okay. yes, just to, sorry, just to add to that, I, uh, I agree. And uh, sorry, I should be disagreeing. But the other thing, to, the other important thing to say is that. Uh, and watching the French news nightly is interesting because there's always a slot about the um, the cost of living um, crisis, particularly prices at the supermarket, everyday living going up and up and up. And of course, these are the people who are voting for her. So if sanctions really start, but and of course, it's interesting at the moment, there are uh, several big, big um, French companies who are still trading in Russia. Um, and so uh, mm. so I think uh, it, it sh- she'll be led uh, to an extent, by the how the the sanctions and what's going on in Ukraine is impacting day to day living in France. Okay, guys. Well, my very final thing, I'm afraid I'm going to put you on the spot. What do you think the <laughs> result is going to be, Gavin? What percentage and which candidate do you think is going to win? I think Macron will win, and uh, I'm going to go for about 52-48. Okay, so a Brexit style vote. Yeah, Brexit style Gavin, vote. Yeah. Which is pretty much what the polls are saying at the moment. Um, Georgina, what do you reckon? Actually, they've widened. Uh, so I think 55 now, 45. So uh, okay. It could, could change. So I might pride myself in never giving away predictions. That's that's a really, <laughs> it's a cop out. Um, but, but I've written, I've written in pieces that I think, I think Macron will uh, uh, probably win. So that's this. But I think the race will be really tight. Um, and there are a number of things that could go wrong uh, that could change that. Um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm. I assume by go wrong you mean for Macron. For Macron, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 not not yeah. You know, who who am I? To, I don't. Un- unfortunately, for for someone who really cares about France, I don't get to cast my vote here, so it's not right. Okay. Hands, but 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 yes, for him, um, it it could go wrong. Well, I actually, I made my own one yesterday at a similar event to this, and I said uh, Macron by about 10%. So hopefully one of us will be right, and uh, who knows? If only for the sake of being right, rather than my own opinion. Um, Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone who has uh, tuned in. And, yeah, please join us again for our next CapEx Live, which I'm sure will be imminent, uh, yet to be announced. Thanks very much. Take care.